everybody. You should be here for the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Road to the Future, the multi-year roadmap. Uh, if you're not, you should stay anyway. This will be the best 45 minutes of the summit. So you're in a good room. Uh, my name is Mike McGrath. I work in platform engineering, building RHEL. I'm responsible for also some of the emerging technologies that we're working on. So uh, Fedora, some of the Centos stuff, some of the uh, uh, Atomic and now CoreOS. And I'm an ops guy by trade, have a lot of years under my belt with uh, operations experience, and uh, I'm a Linux lover by choice. Hey everyone, uh, I am Siddharth Nagar. I am product manager, uh, working on the RHEL portfolio of technologies. Um, I help curate requirements, make sure we have the right priorities, um, and feed that into Mike's team. So uh, do keep in mind just the, the standard disclaimer. Uh, sharing a product roadmap sets a stage for a strategic discussion. We can all have a conversation, learn, and innovate together. But this is not a promise for a future delivery. It is our vision for the product and a medium for expressing our long-term roadmap uh, product plans. And as Mike said, what you're going to hear and what we're going to share today um, is really more exploratory. Uh, we're, we're really glad that you're here. We're really excited to share with you all the stuff that we're working on. Uh, but please keep in mind that this isn't specific to a particular release or a particular version. Uh, the value that we're going to be delivering is going to be provided th th throughout uh, our portfolio releases. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we, as we talk about some of this, the, the new stuff that we're talking about. And as we get closer, we'll provide uh, more guidance on when you can expect that available in a, in a rel productized form. Yep. And as far as the elephant in the room goes, uh, let's be honest, there's eight elephants in that room right now. So uh, uh, we can all pay attention here. And uh, we do have a live uh, way to ask questions and make comments for us. If you have questions on specific <coughs> slides, please do uh, make them. We'll try to answer them at the end. Uh, but there will be a reminder at the end, there's also booths downstairs that you can go to and join us and talk. So, uh, it used to be simple for us. We'd log into a server, uh, we'd change it and fix it, and go home for the night. Uh, then things got a little bit more complicated. Uh, more s multiple servers, larger clusters. Uh, we had virtual machines that we had to deal with. Uh, now we're managing entire data centers, uh, countless virtual machines. Sometimes we don't even know how many we have. Uh, on several architectures. Uh, now we're asked to manage cell phones and uh, IoT devices. Uh, you know, things like that were not what I had originally got into the business to do. Uh, in fact, there was a, a note out from a security firm called uh, Darktrace. Ten gigabytes of data was stolen via a internet-connected fish thermometer in a, in a tank. That, just, that was never in a job description that I've ever seen in my life, that I would be asked to uh, uh, guard a fish thermometer. And on top of that, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the U.S. Bureau, uh, job growth in our sector for, for administration and network operations is expected to be at about 6% a year. Uh, but if you look at the IDC numbers, uh, virtual deployments is expected to grow at about 16%, <coughs> and new server shipments with Linux on them is about 11.8%. Another way to look at that is uh, the stuff that we are asked to do is growing twice as fast as we are. And so we've got to be a lot smarter about how we're going to be managing things in the future. Okay, so you guys know who we are. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. So we thought a little informal poll uh, would help uh, us assess where, where, where this audience stands. So um, how many of you guys are system administrators? Ah, nice. quite, quite a few. Mike, that's your, that's your background, right? My brother. <laughs> All right. um, any purchasing type people? Sort of, kind of? You guys right. are okay, too. You, you guys are super important to me, so <laughs> come, come over here on the front row, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, developers, do we have any developers in the audience? Fantastic, we, we have stuff in store for you that we'd love to share. Um, how about IT managers? Very cool, very cool. Um, gamers, game enthusiasts, work work well workstation users. Excellent. And who here um, is completely confused on, on why they're here? <laughs> Mostly Red Hatters, I would fully expect that. <laughs> good deal, good deal. All right, so uh, a as we follow our journey here, uh, we've come a long way uh, with 
um, taking all the great work that the community does, continues to do, participating and providing that uh, intelligence from our customer and really delivering something that our customers can deploy in the enterprise. Um, and we believe that the value that we deliver uh, with Red Hat and specifically RHEL uh, can really be categorized around three pillars. Uh, and you may have heard this uh, series of themes uh, in the, uh, the, the more general roadmap that, that you might have attended um, yesterday. Um, so control, confidence, and freedom are really the, the pillars that we think meets the needs of, of all the personas that we talked about earlier. Um, and not only do I find myself interacting directly with our customer base, uh, but RHEL uh, continues to fuel the Red Hat portfolio. And our investment in Red Hat Enterprise Linux remains very strong. So some of the things that uh, I'd like to whet your appetite on what we're going to talk about um, include providing better control and fine-grained definition of how you curate content, how you create your corporate standard build. It's rarely just a case of you taking what we give you and deploying that in production. Another area that you're going to hear us talk about is um, helping you uh, extend the capabilities of the operating system, uh, both with what we provide you and with, with very little effort um, being able to, to extend applications all the way down to controlling the hardware. And last but certainly not the least, it's, it's never about just the node. And so uh, Mike will share some very cool things that we're doing to make sure that RHEL um, can be very easily integrated in a systems management um, environment that you have either from Red Hat or that you may have uh, from a third party. How we uh, reinforce confidence is making sure that your mission critical applications are available um, five nines. Um, and uh, while RHEL has been uh, very, uh, very much in that, uh, in that segment, making sure that the applications with our high availability uh, stack um, are available, we're extending, we've extended that into the cloud and all the other deployment footprints that you see today. So you're going to hear a little bit about that. And finally, freedom. Freedom of choice, all the way from application development down to the deployment, down to, the, to where you're actually running it on the footprint for all the different environments, staging, production, uh, and development. Um, and then we're going to sort of tie it off with all the things that you've learned today. How might those come together um, end to end uh, in, a, in, a, in a use case? Uh, so trying to make it a little bit real for you guys. And as you can see, all this stuff requires a lot of work. Uh, and very, we're, we're very grateful to the community. We participate. Um, our development model is open source based. But everything that I talked about earlier uh, still requires us a lot of work to make sure that we're meeting the workloads, we're tuning, we're working with our ecosystem to make sure that the underlying infrastructure continues to work. Um, and so in that sense, uh, we firmly believe that the operating system matters. Um, and I'm super excited that you are here with us and have invested in RHEL, um, and we're here to tell you that, that, that we'll continue that journey together as we go ahead. So Mike, tell us what we can expect under control. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what control is and what we're expecting from it. So when we talk about control today in this room, what we're talking about is management at scale. Again, not just a single system, but a, an ecosystem of systems. Uh, and security aut automation, basically taking things that you care about and making sure that you can deal with all of these different things. So having a f solid foundation is very important for large enterprises. As a systems administrator, you need to very quickly and suddenly add new compute power or quickly provision environments for CI or greenfield deployments. Uh, you need to work very closely with your developers who may have fairly abstract ideas about what they actually want. Uh, we'll just say that. And so one of the things that we've been looking at, uh, at working on is Composer. Uh, Composer is a really great uh, way that you can uh, create new custom trees and images and uh, consume content from Red Hat's portfolio, including third parties and uh, custom software that, that you write. Uh, to make image, you can create images like DVD installers, file system uh, level images, uh, virtual cloud, uh, and even atomic-like builds if you want to build your own uh, atomic-like builds. 
Uh, and it's got, uh, you know, we're working with full integrations with satellites and cloud forms and other cloud providers. Uh, being able to build, so, you know, some people really rely on that gold image functionality, and this really helps supercharge the ability to, to make those and keep them up to date. Uh, but that's only one part of, of, of the, the system there. Uh, the other thing is configuring those systems. And one thing that has been asked of us, especially since the Ansible acquisition, is to better provide support for common tooling uh, that, that everybody's using. Uh, there's a lot of secret sauce that each of you have at your, your companies, uh, but I doubt that keeping really good uh, NTP time is one of them. Uh, I doubt that maintaining your Kerberos infrastructure is one of them. And so what we're trying to do is take some of that offload off of you, especially during uh, upgrade scenarios, and make sure that that is a seamless experience that you can integrate with. And uh, we've introduced system roles, I think, in, in 7.4 as, uh, as a preview. Uh, but as we go forward, we're going to be uh, adding things like better network support, uh, SE Linux, uh, email enabled, uh, SE Linux and email enabled uh, modules. And uh, those, will be fully, uh, those will be supported at some point in time in the future. Uh, and the last part of this is to look at integrating these things with your CI infrastructure. A lot of the technologies that we're talking about today, and Composer is certainly one of them, uh, will come with a fully featured API. <laughs> Uh, that's because some of our more sophisticated customers are now using CI, not just for testing code that is going out, but using it for integrating an entire environment. Uh, they can uh, create entire environments on demand and destroy them on demand, uh, whether or not in pre-production or production environments. And so being able to automatically create gold images, pump it through tests, build an entire environment of potentially hundreds or maybe thousands of machines, run your tests and destroy the whole thing is an incredibly powerful thing. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about management. Uh, once, those, once those environments are up, you know, especially the large ones, uh, managing a large environment is difficult. And the bigger they get, the harder it is. So uh, once you're keeping them identical, is very difficult. And I think when most people look at this picture here, they see a, a sea of red daffodils or tulips. I, I don't know. I'm not a florist. Uh, but what I see is that white thing right in the middle there. Some sort of white flower is popping up in there. Why is it white? Where did its pollen go? Uh, what are its trees doing, or what are its uh, roots doing? I don't know. Maybe Bob did it. I don't care. But I do know it's time to fence it and kill it and create a red flower. Uh, that, that's, that is what we do. So maintaining that, uh, that homogeneity across an entire environment is very important. And while Ansible is an important part of the, of the, the solution, it solves part of that problem, uh, there's other things you need to do too. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was OS tree. So just a quick show of hands. Who here is aware of OS tree or has used it? Oh, that's good. So OS tree, for those who don't know, is one of the underpinnings of, uh, of what we're using in Ansible, or I'm sorry, in uh, Atomic Host. And it provides this great immutability layer, uh, uh, an immutable and layer-based approach to building uh, systems. So if you've used Atomic, you have used OS tree to look at it. It creates a, uh, a, an operating system that's actually very difficult uh, to just get on and change, which in some environments is exactly what you want. Uh, we're going to be making uh, OS tree available via Composer so that you can build your own OS trees. That was one of the big feedbacks we got on Atomic was, this is great, but I want to build my own. Uh, and so we're going to be working on that. And uh, last is uh, another one I want to mention was Toondy. Uh, Toondy is great if you haven't looked at it. Uh, it's a really easy way to uh, create several different profiles. Uh, I see Jeremy back there just, uh, just walking in. He knows Toondy very well. Uh, one of the things, that we, if, you, if you look at the different profiles we have today, uh, there's virtual host and power save and some of those, but we're actually now trying to narrow in on very specific workloads. So like SAP HANA or, uh, or uh, MongoDB, for example. And that will allow you to set that exact same profile up across several different machines to make sure that you have uh, uh, you know, identical configurations across different environments or uh, you know, in, a, in a cluster. Uh, managing uh, configuration files is certainly one thing that's important. Uh, but sometimes managing those tunables uh, is sometimes harder, harder to track, and Tundi will really help there. Uh, and last, <laughs> I wanted to mention uh, that we'll be adding YUM4 at some point in time here, uh, which is our next generation management utility. It's based off of the uh, success and advancements of YUM3, but it'll have greater stability, speed, uh, rollback, which is very important in large environments, uh, and a user-friendly query API. And so while management only goes so far, uh, uh, it doesn't go far enough unless it's also secure. And so with that, I'd like Sidarth to tell us a little bit more about uh, the security part of it. Glad to, Mike. Thank you. Um, if you are uh, interested on the networking side, um, or perhaps you want uh, to make your lives easier for profiling packets and data, um, here's an example of something that we're uh, spearheading here over at Red Hat working with the community. Um, we uh, are working on something called XDP, 
uh, express data path, which is based on um, existing packet filtering technology that's in the kernel today. Um, and the E is the extended part. So we've enhanced that um, to allow you to um, essentially provide more logic at the lowest layer of the networking stack to filter packets. And what we found out is that there's a lot of value in, in addressing that right at the lowest source uh, for performance reasons. You can filter out based on your business uh, logic just the packets that you care about um, and you can, you can forward those on to a profiler or a logging or analysis capability. Um, this is something that, that is, is being worked on. Again, um, we're, we're sharing forward data, so uh, we'll provide more details as we get closer to productization. Uh, the beauty of something like um, XDP is that it, it leverages the existing networking stack. So the, they, we do have technologies available today that allow you to do custom processing, but they bypass the kernel stack and they put that all up in the user space and then you have to figure out how to do it. And not everyone has the investment and skills to do that. So we're trying to make this more generally available to where um, you could very easily create a policy that addresses a, a distributed denial of service. Um, making it very easy for people to, to figure that out and customize and extend the hooks that we have available. Um, as I mentioned, another application for this technology could be uh, profiling and tracing. We have some very large customers that are very interested in this technology because it allows them to use their existing operations um, to, to funnel in um, some of this work. So stay tuned on that and we'll, uh, as it gets closer and closer, we'll be sure to provide more details on it. Okay, so on the confidence side, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, our, our, our deep uh, relationship with our ecosystem. Um, we, we, we as an enterprise class operating system, we cater to a wide variety of workloads um, and a wide variety of workloads across multiple footprints. Um, and so uh, to that end, uh, we've done a lot of work in making sure that uh, the applications and the platform itself is resilient and scale and can, can the workloads can be seamlessly migrated and we can be recovered from a disaster situation very quickly. Long-term life cycle and your existing hardware and peripherals will continue to work across all the updates that we provide is a, is a key differentiator for us compa compared to some of our uh, competitors as well as some of the free distributions. You want a network card or a storage device to continue to work for the full long-term deployment that you have preserving your investment. So we're going to continue to do that. Mike, walk us through some of the things that we can uh, share with them on how we're reinforcing confidence. Of course. So uh, one of the things I do want to, before we do it, I, I am very curious, oh. uh, just another show of hands. Uh, well, where are you most confident in hosting your infrastructure? So uh, we'll do the first one first is uh, on-premise, in your own data center. Still a lot of confidence there. Uh, how about in the public cloud? Who feels most confident in the public cloud? Wow. F fully okay. public. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who feels most confident with a, a hosting provider or partner that is not a public cloud? We've got one, okay. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and say uh, on-premise. That uh, seemed like that a seems pretty, yep. pretty clear crowd favorite. That's good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the confidence that you have uh, in a scenario really depends on when things go wrong. I think uh, we've all had a bad night or two, or 30, uh, when it comes to rapid recovery. And uh, Red Hat is working on many things to make your life easier. For those that aren't, aren't, uh, aren't aware uh, of this picture, I'm just curious, just a quick show of hands. Who here thinks they know what this is? Okay. It, it is. And what, uh, what are you seeing sticking out of the micrograph? <laughs> that is a tin whisker. Uh, so for, uh, you may, some of you may not be aware of this. I wasn't aware of this. Uh, sometimes metal, when you let it sit for a while, it grows conductive whiskers. And they can grow pretty far. Uh, it has caused outages. They have uh, tracked satellite outages to this. Uh, certainly nobody's fault, but uh, it is unfortunate that... Uh, Tin can grow whiskers, and, uh, and that's what we use in some things to, <laughs> to conduct electricity. Uh, I, uh, I had uh, my first experience with this, and I don't know if it was true or not, but we had a, a data center outage 
uh, several years ago where the, the, the HVAC system uh, died on me. I'm just curious, who here has had, uh, had a, a, an HVAC system outage? I'm curious, how, right here, how did you find out about the outage? Yeah, it was pe th that's what happens, right? It's, it, this, is a this is a catastrophic event. So he, he found out from some alerts that came in and then people on site uh, uh, you know, told you about it. This is, this is something your company, <coughs> your company will find out very quickly. It's not something that stays in the IT department. Uh, uh, in, in my case, uh, I was going to lunch, got an alert that my hard drive was hot, thought that was weird, put it back. And it was maybe five minutes later, I got seven or eight other alerts, very rapid succession, it happens very quickly. Uh, so I skipped lunch that day, got back, uh, got back to work. Everybody's in a, in a big panic, and two things happen. Uh, one is that uh, this is a completely unpredictable failure. You have no idea which servers have auto shut themselves down, which ones attempted to stay up and, and, and shoot it out, which ones now have data loss or damage. Uh, and the other thing that is true is that lots of people are going to come to help. And so one thing that you can do is to be prepared for these sort of unknown uh, outages. Uh, you're gonna have systems that won't boot, uh, and I think this is probably true with a lot of us, and, and certainly true with me at the time. Uh, we had a lot of in-house Windows expertise, and a lot of those Windows experts are very smart people. I respect them very much, but do not know their way around a Linux box, uh, which at, for me at the time was very unfortunate because I could have used a lot of help. So uh, Red Hat's developing a lot of next generation tools to better prevent uh, and mitigate even the worst failure scenarios. Uh, so if you've been to uh, some of those sessions, I think the, the first roadmap session mentioned Boom as something that we're working on, and it'll allow you to get uh, snapshots and boot from those snapshots, uh, which can do a couple things. One is if, uh, uh, as long as the drives are still good, uh, you'll be able to boot from them. Uh, but also as you are troubleshooting and trying to get things back up, if you need to make changes, uh, you can do that uh, at a lower risk threshold, uh, which will allow you to roll back to a, a known good configuration. Uh, we're also looking at using, uh, or at, uh, increasing our HA footprint in cloud. So we have already brought uh, the HA uh, suites and, and tools to uh, Amazon and Azure cloud <coughs> platforms. We're looking to add uh, the other premier uh, platforms like Google and Alibaba, and so you can watch for that soon. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, XFS ref links. Uh, so this will allow uh, 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 admins to make a sort of directory level snapshot, uh, which can be very helpful. Uh, and we fully expect this to be a common tool in, uh, in uh, failure recovery, uh, especially in, in troubleshooting. Now, if you're, if you're paying attention, one thing that uh, you might notice or you might have put two and two together uh, is that uh, uh, being able to do these sort of connections between uh, several different systems are things you can set up ahead of time. And so while some systems that are already out there may be difficult to migrate, uh, but doing these sort of uh, 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 snapshot and rollback type scenarios are really great for CI environments. Uh, and next up to solve the Windows problem uh, is Cockpit. So if you haven't used Cockpit, I really suggest you take a look, even for the hardcore, never leave the home row types. Uh, it's become the de facto interface uh, to work with uh, uh, rail boxes, and we have several demos downstairs that you can go look at that have uh, Cockpit tooling in them. Uh, it's a modern tooling, and uh, it does quite a few things. It, uh, it's, it's done in real time. It doesn't have some sort of separate database that you have to interact with. It interacts directly with the configs and, uh, and services on the system. Uh, it's gonna be a great uh, gateway for Windows admins that wanna learn how to do uh, Unix in, a, uh, in an environment that is, is more common to them and, and safer. It uses terminologies that they use, but they don't have to know the order of a command line tool, what the names are, things like that. Uh, we're adding better support for video, RAID, and disk encryption. Uh, we're also looking at integrating with other tools. So for example, if you have satellite, uh, the ability to, you know, in your satellite uh, view, click and jump to uh, an admin console on the box in real time and have a real actual shell uh, is one of the things you'll be able to have here. And finally, you have much more sophisticated uh, health indicators, which is, is very important. Awesome, thank you, Mike. <coughs> We're on to freedom. Freedom, I feel like the Braveheart uh, chant over here. Um, so how, how do we allow you, how do we get out of the way and allow you guys to do what you do best? Um, and so in this, in this theme, we focused really hard on giving uh, developers choice. Um, we're also going to be making sure that we, we are tying together and integrating all the pieces. Um, so, so we're not having to have you assemble them on your side and try to figure that out. Um, that's, that's what we think is a value that we provide uh, with the value that, that you have uh, entrusted with us. Um, 
And so with that, Mike, uh, why don't you tell us about what's happening there? Yeah, so this is a pretty common, uh, a common phrase, I think, that, uh, that you, you guys are hearing more, and we definitely are, is uh, we needed it yesterday. So next generation applications move quick. Sometimes it feels uh, chaotically quickly. Uh, and it often feels very uncoordinated, uh, which results in very complex requirements, often conflicting requirements, and very complex architectures, uh, especially with how they interact act with each other. The explosion of microservices uh, is a really good example of this. Uh, those development teams often are, are more so now than ever, are being empowered to build the solution now, get it ready to go, and ship it out. It uh, doesn't really matter what it is. And so we see a lot of developers that are bringing their own languages and tools and libraries uh, regardless of what the operations team uh, has available, and then they throw it over the wall and the operations team has to deal with it. So uh, in terms of DevOps, like not a full DevOps flow, but I don't know, maybe a, a, maybe a, a senior director might hear that and say, that sounds like DevOps, but really it's not. So one thing we're looking at doing is uh, better adding support for, uh, uh, for the, to, to fix the conflicting version uh, library requirements, as well as uh, provide you with uh, several different languages that move at, uh, at speeds that you, that you want uh, without having to go, you know, just to willy-nilly, uh, some willy-nilly site and pull them down. You have no idea where they came from. Uh, that's going to be very, uh, very important. Uh, but we're not just looking at, at languages. We're also looking at databases and other tooling as well uh, to do multi-version uh, that you can pull down on a life cycle that you want. Uh, a big part of that is because even though uh, a lot of these new and emerging technologies are popular and uh, they're being adopted very quickly, the upstreams often don't coordinate <coughs> with each other very well. And that's a place that Red Hat really excels at. And that's very true for some of the newest stuff like uh, Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, that's one thing that we're really looking at. And that 10-year life cycle is great. Like, we're still going to have that. That's not going away. But there's also going to be uh, other life cycle choices, especially for some of these application layer uh, packages that you want. And uh, I think that's going to be a very popular option for us going forward. Fantastic. So I'll just pause here and just, uh, we've, we've thrown a lot of things at you. Um, ju just by show of hands, uh, what Mike talked about with respect to having more uh, uh, choice in content that you get from, from RHEL and Red Hat, is, is that something that, that is of value uh, to you guys? I see a big thumbs up there. Um, the, the difference here is that what would typically require you to wait for the next major version, uh, we're trying to make sure that we can try and provide that to you sooner. So whether uh, you're, you're moving to uh, your, your new application requires a new version of uh, an, a, a dependency, uh, you, and, and that dependency is not available in the current version of RHEL, uh, we're trying to make it so you don't have to wait until the next version of RHEL. And truth be told, you, we have that today um, in the form of software collections and developer tool set. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is, is make that uh, uh, less uh, w adoptable but with less friction. We want to make sure that that fits your workflow. So thank you for that feedback. OK, so um, we thought that uh, we, would, we would try to bring together a lot of the, the, the piece parts that we've talked about um, into a, uh, a hypothetical scenario where these things might come together and how Red Hat, and specifically RHEL, is helping you uh, support your workloads. Um, so I have here uh, a, a, a toy company or, or an, a consulting company that has been hired to predict the next killer toy for the, for the, for the holiday season. And you could just as easily uh, substitute based on your industry, whether it's analyzing seismic data, oil and gas, education, uh, missile systems. Um, but I think the problem is the same. Um, we are seeing a, a data explosion. We're seeing a lot of uh, sources of data. And it's getting to be quite a challenge to be able to, A, collect that, and, and more importantly, analyze that and, and try and come up with some business knowledge for decisions. So in this case, um, we took the example of an in-memory database. So you have an application that's collecting a lot of this information and storing it in in-memory for very, very quickly trying to sift through it. Mike mentioned SAP HANA. That's a really good example uh, where we are partnering with a company like SAP for a joint solution uh, to bring to market uh, for our customers to be able to very rapidly make decisions and collect data. And so 
on the surface, we provide you with all the dependencies. We have joint uh, offerings that we can, we can share, best practices. We have uh, performance and tuning metrics that we can share. But let's explore under the covers how that goes all the way down to the infrastructure. Um, this, these are just highlights, some of the key things, some of the key pieces of technologies that go in support of, of you allowing to, to, to run your uh, application. Um, let's start with something called five-level paging. Um, and so it is true that um, given the pace of innovation that uh, memory addressing and, and, and the specifications from the hardware vendors is growing. And so we have uh, pretty close to reached the limit um, where on x86 um, you can address up to 256 terabytes um, of address space and 60, 64 terabytes of physical. Um, what the five level paging technology allows you to do is it allows you to extend that uh, to much higher levels for the workloads that you expect to address for tomorrow. Um, and so with, with five level uh, paging, you can, you can extend that to something like 128 petabytes of virtual um, and I believe four petabytes of physical um, addressable space. So we're, we're, we're working with um, our partners such as Intel to make sure that um, you have the insurance policy to be able to scale to your workloads as you get to them. Um, another good example, um, as uh, f seismic shifts in, in trends with merging of what was considered uh, traditional memory or volatile memory and storage starts to really gain traction, um, there becomes a need for us to A, work with our ecosystem on the hardware side to be able to expose those through the platform um, and allow you to be able to have memory and storage essentially co-located very close to the processor for, for low latency. Also on the scalability side, um, based on your workload, particularly things like analysis, seismic data, uh, it is the case where uh, GPUs are getting to be uh, complementary to uh, traditional uh, stock CPU. Um, and so there's a lot of work that, that has happened working with our partners such as NVIDIA, Intel, and all, all, all the others to make sure that we provide a very seamless integration uh, so you can take advantage of your applications um, right from the operating system layer and you don't have to go out for that. On the efficiency side, you may have heard of something called HMM. Um, heterogeneous memory management. Um, and, and this is re really have, have to do with having a very uh, transparent and a single user space for addressing memory closest to the processor. Uh, without this, it becomes kludgy because you, your application has to handle and allocate memory one way for the traditional RAM and another way for the, for the GPU. And so we're trying to make lives easier for our developers to where they don't have to worry about that from user space, it's all very s seamless. Guest level optimization. So some things that we're looking at is how do we make our platform um, just enough for the environment that you're running in? So some things that we're looking at uh, just from a, from a packaging and structure uh, point of view is making the, the, the rel kernel modular. Um, so for example, you probably don't need Bluetooth drivers to run on AWS. And so having these additional things that are really not really relevant for that deployment footprint bloat, uh, bloat your system, unnecessary memory usage, unnecessary storage usage, and that gets really important if you're in a cloud and you're paying by the gigabyte. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're addressing um, today and will continue uh, in the future is, is making sure that where, where you're in a metered environment, that you have a very slimmed down version of just what you need. And it's not just the kernel. It goes all the way up to all the rel content that we provide. Mike mentioned something called VDO, uh, Virtual Data Optimizer. And that's just really a fancy term for making sure that you're utilizing storage in a very efficient and cost-effective way. 
And we, we got this technology from an acquisition that we, ma uh, we made earlier. Um, Permabit is the company. And, and what, what that brought us was a very, very seamless way to um, provide deduplication abilities as well as compression. And this really starts to, to shine in um, high-end storage systems, where the, which are extremely expensive. You want to make sure that you're, you're using, you're, you're getting your um, cost per uh, gigabyte um, to the full extent. So the video technology, again, you should never have to interact with it directly. Uh, we're integrating it uh, right in the kernel, right exposed from, from our LVM. Um, and it is available to you wherever RHEL is available. Um, it's, it's two kernel modules, essentially. So I encourage you to, to, to look into that. And that's available um, in, in the RHEL 7 series today. And we're going to continue to improve on that. Last but not least, um, host level optimizations. Um, we talked about tuning profiles. We talked about configuration. We talked about being smart about where RHEL is deployed and in what uh, environment. And making it very easy for you to have that seamless experience out of the box. Um, and where your organization may uh, not be fully staffed for a full Linux uh, system administration model, things like the, the web con system console um, to try and make it easy to onboard those who are perhaps not as familiar uh, with the nuances of tuning a, and configuring a Linux system. All running on the deployment of your choice. We fully understand that you're on different uh, areas of your journey. Uh, you, you, we learned today that this, you know, you're, you're probably closer to the traditional uh, data center on premises. Great, we'll support you there. When you are ready to, to move to the next level, if at all, know that Red Hat and RHEL will be with you to guide you through that journey with, with the same experience and the long-term stability that you're used to uh, where you work. Mike, why don't you tell us about some things that we're doing on the upgrade side that uh, would be of use to them? I will. So uh, CNC moving workloads uh, from Inter Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 to 7 and 7 and beyond uh, will give you a little bit more freedom than you have to modernize applications. Uh, it used to be that operating systems were tied to the hardware that you purchased. Your hardware would go uh, EOL, and you'd buy new hardware, and you put a new operating system on it. Uh, but that's not the case now. Uh, virtual machines in particular can move from location to location uh, regardless of what uh, hardware they're on, making them virtually immortal in the most terrifying way possible. <coughs> so a quick show of hands, uh, who, here has, I, who here has migrated from uh, one major version of RHEL to another or has at least wanted to on their system? Okay, that's very good. <coughs> uh, part of what we're working on is a new upgrade suite uh, that has uh, infrastructure and lifecycle support uh, considerations end to end. And so what you're seeing in this graphic is part of a, a, a pre-upgrade tool uh, that scans the system before you would do the upgrade uh, and will provide you uh, basically an estimation of how high risk that upgrade would be. Uh, that same suite of tools can upgrade uh, from major releases or minor releases. So for example, you could move from RHEL 6 to 7 or even RHEL 7 to 7.1. Uh, or 7.5, if you want. Uh, and uh, the other thing that you may be noticing is, again, you know, some of these tools can be put together uh, to make your lives easier. And a lot of times when I say easier, I mean like a more junior admin can do them. So if, again, if you take a boom and combine it with this tooling, you now have somebody that does not need to be your most senior architect going through and doing a system upgrade. Uh, they can go through, they can do a risk analysis, they can try the upgrade, and if it fails, they can do a rollback on boom. Uh, it makes it very great. Uh, and again, this is another really powerful system that you could use when combined with CI. Just imagine if every single one of the changes that you made had a risk analysis done to try to future-proof what was going to happen down the road. Uh, you know, imagine you're making a change and a client says, this is going to be a high-risk change, here's why. Uh, you could back that out before it even gets to production uh, if you think you may want to upgrade that system in the future. <coughs> and finally, I don't want to go too deep into uh, the Coros and Atomic uh, announcements that we have. Those that aren't aware, we did acquire uh, CoreOS. They're actually just a couple of blocks from here, their headquarters. And uh, we're working very closely, uh, well, this new merged team is now working very closely together to create a new successor to uh, Atomic Host. Uh, we're going to bring an industry-leading uh, container-optimized operating system to the table. Uh, there are several people down in the uh, booth area that you can chat with if you want to learn more. 
Uh, and so with that, I just do want uh, to pitch that there is a, uh, a rel the Red Hammer Project roadmap session. This is kind of the multi-year, longer-term stuff that we're talking about. Uh, the roadmap session from Denise and, and Ron uh, are more kind of immediate future items. And uh, they'll be in room, uh, they'll be, I guess, in this room uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Uh, I mentioned the booth. You can come down and meet us uh, at booth uh, 511. Uh, I'm actually going to be there directly after this uh, session, so feel free. And there's other people in the room here, too, that are red hairs that will be down there. So feel free to come uh, ask questions, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, but again, that conversation will continue down there. I just wanted to put in a plug-in <laughs> for demos. If you haven't visited the IT optimization area down on the Expo floor, uh, please do check it out. A lot of what we talked about here is showcased there. And you can get some hands-on experience in, on, uh, on what we're doing there. OK, great. And uh, with that, I thank you. I'll check. There, there were two questions here that I'll take a look at. Uh, we have just a, a minute or two to answer them. Uh, so any timeline for RHEL 8 was a, a question I was asked. I, I never heard anybody talk about RHEL 8, so I, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm afraid not. <coughs> uh, another question uh, from Ken in the audience. Uh, will uh, eBPF be available on a default install or extra tools be needed? Uh, default installs. So it's, it's um, something that's being worked on upstream. Um, so it's a, it should be available on a default install. It's not configurable. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, last question from Crispin. Uh, is there any more work planned to enhance the hot plug or hot add, like dynamic removals, uh, quantifying or eliminating the overhead of enabling, uh, and do customers use it? So I know I have a comment on it, so go ahead. Uh, I, I'll just start and say yes. Uh, yes and yes. I mean, that's something that we're working both at the physical layer as well as the virtual layer, and they all have to sort of work. Um, so we're working very closely with our hardware partners uh, to make sure that that's an easy experience. But it is a very complicated thing, particularly the remove part. How do you, how do you make sure you map that to the new relocations? Um, so that's a work in progress, but I feel like uh, it's, it's pretty mature now, it's a, you know, but I'd love to hear more of your pain points so we can influence the product there. Yeah, and, and I've, been I've been tracking this one particularly in cloud <coughs> environments where it's absolutely critical that things get added and removed kind of seamlessly. So I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying watching us do this uh, 